And then what? How do I change my uh, my oh, slide? You just do it as, as normal. Okay. Uh, by, okay. by clicking or what? Um, just arrows. Arrows. This arrow will uh -huh. move forward and this backward? Uh, this is forward. This is uh -huh. This is backward. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Can I get everybody's attention? Uh, first off, uh, please uh, turn off your cell phones so there's be nothing going on during the talk outside of our speaker here. Um, and uh, this is a uh, part of our spring seminar series. This is something that we do every year. And we've had all kind of talks. We've had talks on physics education. We've had talks on uh, advanced theoretical physics, particle physics, relativity, uh, pretty much everything. Uh, today's talk is gonna be a little bit different because we're gonna be talking about uh, more like history, but this is actually about a physicist in particular. And um, what I'm going to do, you can see the abstract on the board, but uh, what I'm going to do is I want to introduce our speaker, and then I'll turn it over to him uh, to talk more about the uh, physicists that, we'll be, uh, that he'll be discussing. Um, this is uh, Yanish uh, Grubovich. He is an um, associate professor of chemistry and physics at the University of Houston downtown. Uh, he started off at the Polish Ac uh, Academy of Sciences, where he got his Ph.D., and then he did postdoctoral studies at uh, um, RPI, uh, Rensselaer Polytech Institute. He was also at the uh, Max Planck Institute in uh, Germany. Is that in Potsdam? Uh, Mike. Mike. And uh, also he did another postdoc at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And uh, he also spent 15 years at the Shell Technology Center in Houston, Texas, before uh, joining the faculty at University of Houston downtown. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to our speaker and uh, you'll have plenty of time to ask questions after his talk. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, Dave, for invitation and Digni for making this possible. And also, Anya who put it on the website. I have this distinct pleasure to talk to the physics department, to students of physics, about a physicist, about a person. This is something that we never take or never have enough time during our physics lecture to, to talk about. We usually put the picture, this is a Max Planck, right, or something, and five seconds later we are talking about about phenomena, not never about about people. This physicist, Maria Skłodowska Curie, who is known more more broadly as Madame Curie, is an extraordinary person. In 2009. The readers of the scientists voted, voted her the most influential, the most important woman scientist ever in the history. The next came Rosalind Franklin, also great, great physicist, um, <coughs> with 10% vote, vote less, which is England. <coughs> um, uh, let me learn about how to this back. Back. Okay. In this book by Crowther, there are six great scientists. Look, this is head. One, two, three, four, five men and one woman. Well, this happened to be published again. Okay. It is uh, especially nice to work. To work. Last year, France and Poland declared the year of, well, 2011, a year of Maria Skłodowska Curie. This is on top of, of international, well, I'm still learning this. Um, <coughs> in the United Nations declaring it International Year of Chemistry. 
2011, it was International Year of Chemistry declared by the United Nations and those two um, uh, countries, Poland and France, declared Maria Skłodowska Curie year to commemorate 100 years anniversary for her to obtain her second Nobel Prize. I said second, not because she late earlier she obtained her first. Now, at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris, an opera was um, was presented as a tribute to to her last year. The same in city of Gdańsk. In Los Angeles, Alan Alda has uh, written a theater play, Radiant, the, page, the Passion of Maria Curie. It was shown at the Geffen Playhouse for many, many weeks last year. And at the US Congress Rotunda, there was an exhibit last year on her on her tribute, and to presenting uh, her as one of the most celebrated scientists of, of, of all time, indicating that she is and French patriot. Well, of course, to have an honor to have an exhibition in the rotunda of U.S. Congress, you must be somebody great, nothing less. You must be great. But. Uh, and she achieved this, this, great, this greatness. But in order to become great, well, everybody has to start the same way. She was born first here in this house in Warsaw on November 1867, almost 45 years ago. As a child to the family of three sisters and, and one brother, actually four sisters and, and one brother. Their mother died uh, pretty early, but they were fortunate, she was fortunate enough to be born to the family of teachers. Her parents valued education above all. Her father was also a physicist and physics teacher. However, at that time, Poland did not exist as political uh, entity, and Warsaw was under Russian occupation. Under the law at the time, girls were not allowed to pursue higher education. High school only was allowed. And she went to high school and she finished at the top of her class. And her, here, her education dilemma began, talented and curious, but not allowed to study. Only, and higher education was forbidden, including arrest and, and severe penalty. Here we have a picture with her father and three sisters already much bigger. The Skodowski were middle-class family with limited resources. So she had to go to work. And she took a job as a private teacher, governor, for some wealthy family and held this job for six years. She tutored and studied illegally at the clandestine floating university. This is the picture of her uh, at the age of finishing high school. Occasionally, she had a chance, however, to do some research in this building, which is the museum, which was Museum of Industry and Agriculture in Warsaw. The lab at that time was run by her close cousin, who had been an assistant to, in St. Petersburg to the great Russian chemist Mendeleev. And you remember Mendeleev was working on his very famous periodic table of elements. The table is what? A ray of boxes, right? Some of those boxes 
were empty at the time that he put it all together. But he said, those boxes will be filled by elements which are going to be discovered in the future. How prophetic it was at that time. Now, at age of 24, it was 1891, she moved to Paris in order to pursue higher education. She had to move out of Poland. She went to Paris and enrolled at Sorbonne, the world leading university at, at the time, and still one of the leading universities. And at this moment, she became international student. Do we have international students here? Well, yeah, and I am also, I used to be international student. I know what it is. I know what is the pain of, of uh, having not enough money, uh, having not sufficient language uh, skills. And in her particular case, there was no male student there. Why? Because she was the first female student to be enrolled at Sorbonne ever. First female student, first female student who, who, went, who registered to physics. First female student who finished physics, actually in two years, and then math in one year. Showing this great talent, well, and having this curiosity for science, she was looking for a research project. Then she decided to do research with, at that time, very, very famous professor, Henri Becquerel, who just discovered a new kind of radiation. However, and he published, he presented this, this, uh, this discovery in, in, the, in the meetings, but at this time, William Rentgen also discovered X-rays. And the whole attention of the whole uh, scientific community went to X-rays. So he better just announced this new radiation and put it aside and also went to, to study uh, this new X-ray, right? And gave the, that project, this new project on, on new type of, of radiation to his uh, assistant, Pierre Curie, and then when she approached him, he said, well, why don't you go and work with him? Okay, there is a, something new, why don't you go and, and, and let's see what is going to come out of. So this is the picture of Henri Becker. Well, and this is how, how they met. This is Maria Kłodowska at that time, and Pierre Curie. Pierre was already known physicist working on magnetic, magnetic properties dependent on temperature. Today, we are using Curie points, right? This is the same Pierre Curie. They met after years. I tell you a secret, there was a granddaughter, and the granddaughter said that Maria was the most beautiful discovery that Pierre ever made. <laughs> I think it is, huh? <laughs> this is a smart daughter, this granddaughter. And here are uh, the, the conditions. Well, the Carol said, well, there is a shark over there. Why don't you go and work in it? And, and so this is the lab. All walls and the roofs are glass, no heating, so it is very cold in the winter, extremely hot, hot in the summer, plus there is a hole in the roof. <laughs> and, well, at least here we have some equipment, which they eventually have to be, and they started to, to study this new kind of radiation. Both Pierre and Maria shared the passion 
for Siam and soon well, for each other. And one year later, see, this is the we wedding picture. And this is some uh, honeymoon spent in the country, yeah, riding bicycles. All the money from collected during the wedding went to, to buying bicycles. And soon after, there was well, this little thing to say. Irena, Irene, and their first child. There will be Eva a few years later. And here, in this picture, we have a Madame Curie or Maria family at the moment. We have this Dr. Dr. Curie, here father, that is Pierre, Maria, and of course and Irene. So the, this this tree, this is Maria's family. There's something wrong with this picture. It is so wrong that I cannot stop laughing. Listen, there is one, two, three people. Now let's count Nobel Prize. One for Pierre. Two, three for Maria, and one for Irene. So family of three receiving one time or the other four Nobel Prizes. This is ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> I always thought that one Nobel Prize per family is quite a bit. Um, so, there was a child, and but nevertheless, the work and passion for discoveries went on. We have some few pictures over here, and uh, you see from this, especially, this is a, uh, one is professor and one is a student. Who do you think is a professor? And who is the student working? Huh? And this from Granit Fair from Library of Congress. And this uh, new research requires a building of completely new instrumentation and com the, uh, designing and uh, inventing completely new analytical methods. But eventually, eventually, it led led to very um, important groundbreaking discovery of this new element that Mendeleev didn't know about it, but had predicted that they will be discovered. That they were polonium and radium. Now, chronologically, it went like this. Then on July 18, 1990, uh, 18, it's 1898, 1898, sorry, <laughs> two years before the end of the 19th century. So they discovered Polonia, and what, six months later, later, raised. And from the, from the paper they wrote uh, about this, they said, we propose that it be named Polonium in honor of the native land of one of us. Of course, it was Maria okay. Polonium, Poland. She was Polish. She was from Poland. Therefore, this name of the, and scientists have the right to, to, to give the name of, uh, of the materials that they, they discovered. It was still 1898. Poland did not exist on the political map. Well, this is a few pictures from the movie that was the Hollywood made in 1930s about her and about them and, and about a discovery of, of radium. And uh, this is how it was pictured. And look, they were bragging going around bragging, just, just holding pieces of radium and showing to their friends, look how nice it is glowing. So, a sort of greenish glow 
جامعه Discovery of radium was, as I once said, a great groundbreaking um, um, event. Why is this? Because it <coughs> a need alpha particles. And then it decays two other elements, but it's not very important. It is radium, but this is what made, made it so special. And emitted in a very particular way, which is spontaneous. Spontaneous. What do I mean by this? There is a big difference between uh, X ray and radiation. Uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, this uh, spontaneous radiation. If you want to have access, you have to make access. You have to have a source of electron. You have to accelerate these electrons using the external force. You have to accelerate those electrons to high energy. They have to hit the target, and then the target emits X-ray. In case of radioactive materials, they emit ra radioactivity by, by themselves, spontaneously. And the statement that they use, radium and polonium emit new radiation spontaneously, this is probably the most significant statement of their, their whole work. Because at this moment, they gave definition of a new class of material, radioactive material. <coughs> well, by that time, some other materials, titanium and some others were already, uh, people were discovering new radioactive materials. But they made it as a class with this statement. And eventually, well, she defended uh, her PhD. And uh, after a series of publications, eventually, Nobel Prize came. Nobel Prize, which was shared with Professor Becquerel as 50% contribution for discovery of new radiation. And the other 50% went to Maria and Pierre for their contribution in, in, in purification of those, uh, of, uh, of, of those materials. And here we have a Nobel Prize diploma. I want to point out two things. That this Pierre Curie and Marie Curie, they exist the science joint, then her, her uh, maiden name is not existing. She goes uh, under Marie Curie. Very first woman who received Nobel Prize ever in physics. They went to receive the Nobel Prize three years later for, for some reason. And guess what? They went to, to Stockholm, and she was not allowed to go on the stage to get her prize, her diploma, her medal, and two others in the, the auditorium. And this is how it is portrayed in Alan Alda's play. This is a actress who plays her character. And then the actress is uh, addressing the, the crowd, saying, being a woman, does it require to be invisible? At the same time, the actor who plays Pierre, he addresses uh, is a picture, men only, men only. So again, one of the, 
one of the biggest steps um, from the social point of view. Early on, they understood that radiation that they are discovering and they are working on has a potential in biological application. And Pierre was going around and saying, look, we can burn, you can burn things on your skin with this radiation. So he was bragging about right, how, how smart we are. We already understand this, right? What, what is that they did not understand that the same radiation can kill you. They understood that probably there is, there is a, uh, one of the important things will be an application to, to cure cancer or some diseases, but they did not un understand that it can also kill a healthy cell as well. And then on April 1906, Three years after the Nobel Prize, Pierre was killed in a street accident. He just fell under the horse carriage and his skull was crushed. And suddenly, she became a single mother. You see, Eva. And look at his face now. Sad. And people say, and the books say, she was sad to the end. It was very traumatic experience for her. At this moment, Pierre's father was very helpful, helping her with raising those children. But her passion for science, for, for discovery, went on and on. And then, eventually, she received, as we see over, over here, her second uh, Nobel Prize. Now, this time in chemistry. And this prize was received for analytical, actually, chemistry, for purification and isolation of radium, which was obtained for the very, very first time in metallic radium. Um, and at this point, after actually after Pierre was killed, even though she was already having a Nobel Prize, she still did not have a job. And she was having like a secondary job at the university at her home. But after his death, they eventually came to a conclusion. Listen, we have a technician with Nobel Prize. Are we? And they offered her a position to replace Pierre, and she accepted it. And became, again, the very first woman professor at the Sorbonne in the history. And all, all the other departments, the very first woman. Well, And she became very deaf, the very first scientist, and the only scientist up to date who received two Nobel Prizes in two science disciplines. There were three other, there are three other people who received two, two Nobel Prizes, but no one actually in two science disciplines. I don't want to, to make it sort of a competition. I'm just uh, giving this, this information because Nobel Prize is Nobel Prize, right? We shouldn't, we cannot say that one is better than the other. But as I mentioned before, then um, isolation of pure radium was a very big deal at that time because really, it really gave scientists a very strong source of this alpha particle. So at this mo moment, a experimentation like this one, but Geiger, Marsden, Rutherford, were possible to be performed. 
this is cutting of alpha particles on the foil of thin foil of gold. And this experiment led to discovery of atoms. And some properties of atom was already um, proposed on the basis of the results of this experiment. The atom must have a middle which is heavy and small and positively charged and electrons which are floating, floating around. And eventually this model of atom was, was uh, was invented and proposed by, by Bohr. No matter how simplistic and simple it is, it is still very useful tool to, co to communicate. We, we begin what electron and electricity, then we say, where charge is coming from? Well, there is positive charge here, here, and negative charge over here. If I take a negative charge, then I have negative charge. And what is left is positive charge. And our lecture on electricity begins this way, right? Here we have those models for polonium and radium. And here, this greatness. Look, 19, 1911. 1911. This very, very famous picture of Solvay Conference, right? One of the most famous in the history of science. All these people, this Mr. Solvay, uh, Belgium uh, industrialist, Rutherford, Einstein, uh, and who is this? Uh, look, all men and only one woman. A recognition by those Nobel Prize winners. They are all Nobel Prize winners. Right, Einstein. Well, Nobel Prize winners, they finance it. Yes, you are great. You are, you are equal to us. Well, 1927, again, see, only one woman. And now, 1931, in Rome, yeah. Congresso Internazionale di Fisica Nucleare di Roma, right? Look, one lady. Here is a meeting of titans. And Albert Einstein said, Madame Curie is the only famous person known to me who was not tainted. I think she was really very quiet and work-oriented person. Well, following her scientific success, the University of Paris decided to, to create a radium institute, and it was funded in 1914. But unfortunately, at the same year, World War I started. And what did she do? Well, the, he, here she is. She put this apron and went to work in the hospital to teach people in the hospital about X-rays. Not about polonium and radium, X-rays, because X-rays was already developed up to the point that was helping people. And with her daughter here. Not only in the hospital. She helped and was instrumental in organizing the whole fleet of mobile X-ray uh, devices. Not only that, she got a driver's license as a first, as first woman having driver's license for a truck. There was not very many trucks at that moment, but anyway. And she was driving those trucks behind, uh, behind the front, front line. And the government, French government didn't like it, but generals did like it because she was helping thousands and thousands of wounded soldiers, taking uh, x-rays and teaching people, right, taking x-rays, so the, the doctor, surgeons we, will know what to sew, what to remove, what to put together, and so on. And they, you know, they refused to pass any the of of their discoveries. They said, we are not going to do this. Let's leave it open. 
and to let everybody take, take advantage of, of, a, um, of, of those um, possibilities that, uh, that the discoveries may create. But, of course, they fin finance it, then uh, stop it. And here comes a contact with the United States. Look, 1920, women's rights to vote became the law. Her second Nobel Prize was 1911. And here, 1920, women did not have the right to vote. But over there, on the other side of the ocean, there was this mega star, woman mega star. And there was this smart woman, Missy Maloney, influential journalist in New York City. She went to Paris and met with uh, Madame Curie, and she secured her first and I think the only interview that was published. And there was a question, Madame Curie, how much radium you have in your institute? And she said, no, nah, because it went to the biological research. I cannot do any physics, I cannot do any chemistry. So Ms. Maloney came back and organized a fundraiser to collect money to buy one gram of radium as a gift to Madame Curie. And here on May 1921, they came, they arrived on, by the ship to New York City. They were greeted, she was greeted with a crowd. And New York Times on the front page said, Madame Curie plans to end all cancer. Of course, baloney. And the next day they had to recount this. And she, well, they said, well, she's planning to, to end like some cancer. <laughs> okay. Here, the business of producing radium was a big, big business at this moment. And here she is with the officials of the Standard Chemical Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. One gram of radium was offered as a gift to Marie Curie. One price, one, the price of one gram of radium was at that time $120,000. Lots of money, right? Funds were collected by Missy Maloney in the amount of 100000 and 20000 was donated by this standard chemical company. And it was, here we, we see her with President Harding, she was a guest to the White House with President Harvey. So, who gave her this gift? Ten vials, or certified by National Bureau of Standards, one ten, with a stamp and everything very official. Now in Paris. At the, in the museum of the Institute du de, de Radium that, uh, that we were showing them before, there is a crack attached which we presented by the President of the United States on behalf of the women of America to Madame Curie, Madame Skodowska Curie, in recognition of her transcendent service to science and to humanity in the discovery of the I think pretty nice. Well, business of producing radium was booming, but not only production of radium. As usual, big discoveries are followed by idiocy. Business can powder so radium, right? If radium is so good that it can um, cure cancer, why not to make a powder out of it? And to look like it better, well, 
powder, nail polish, toothpaste. And now you imagine yourself going on a date in the night glowing <laughs> green, greenish, right? <laughs> yeah, darling, I love you, huh? You have such a pretty smile. Okay, well, after World War, aha, and what is even more curious, look who is the producer of this powder, Dr. Alfred Curie. Has nothing to do with Pierre Curie, with Ma Madame Curie, nothing, but he's a Dr. Alfred Curie. Well, after the First World War, Poland regained an independence and she immediately, almost immediately, um, proposed to, uh, to build a radium institute in Warsaw, which was opened actually, um, it was opened in 1932 and <laughs> And it was equipped with a donation of $50,000 gift from the President of the United States. This time it was President Hoover. She was invited and she stayed at the White House. The very first guest who was not born American who had this honor to stay at the White House to the President Hoover. And he did. $50,000 was donated, which she split actually between Warsaw and Paris Institute and responding to her, to his, uh, to, to President Hoover, she said, in accepting this precious gift, which will happen the opening of the Radio Institute in Warsaw, I offer you and all my American friends the most profound thanks. My laboratory in Paris will keep in close relation to the Warsaw Institute, and I would like to remember the American gift of radium to me as a symbol of enduring friendship bridging your country to France and Poland. I think. It was not easy time in America. We are talking 1930. Right? And this was actually something that did not, well, it was a Madame Curie died in 1934. And what is left as a legacy of her? So, this has not existed before. An application in medicine, industry, all kinds of industry, agriculture, geology, environmental protection. And all of this, any application, can be directly traced back to that discovery and purification of radium. For women, her female, her PhD, her professor, female professor, construction of new instruments and experimental methods and radioactivity. This is a term that she introduced to science. And who is not familiar with the term of radioactivity? And certainly, if you go to, to radiation therapy, you are very well familiar with it. Right? The nuclear physics, radiochemistry, medical physics, polonium radio, and so on. And this is just a short, short list. Yeah. Ionizing radiation. Well, here we have a sort of cross section of a model of nuclear power. Well, not always things were pretty, right? And the future, the future, what I have here. Well, listen, uh, at the beginning, at the turn of 19th and 20th century, we were over here, understanding that there's an atom, a building block of, of the matter. Uh, 
So this 10 to minus uh, 1 uh, centimeter or, 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 or meter, 10 to minus 1 meter, the, the size that we are talking about. And then over the, the, here we are. Marie Curie was around this time, right? Discovered a, a nucleus and and electron, and the structure of of the atom. And here we are at the end of 20th, 21st century. We are looking inside not only a, a nucleus but inside quarks. It's the one of the measures of of a progress. No, oh, no. And now, what is this? It's said, right? Hydron collider. The tunnel under underground, right? The donor. This donor. Twenty seven kilometers around. 100, 100 kilometers uh, in the meters underground. The biggest uh, the biggest uh, uh, nuclear physics laboratory in the world. And inside this, and the, this is a tube, right? And inside this tube, who is in, inside this tube? Look at this. This is, oh, this is you, student. You are inside this tube. Look at this, hey, and with this laptop, right? Therefore, I call this segment a future. So, this is you, students who are trying to understand, to interpret this kind of, of data, to find out what particles they represent here. And you can say, so what? Right? Well, we have particles and particles and particles, but look at this. Hadronen physics in their medicine and biology, hadron therapy. Do you know what they are talking about? I, I don't. I, I'm in different branch of physics, so I have not uh, spent time on understanding. But therapy, it, it looks like maybe the new way of, of curing some diseases, oh. which we hope will come from those discoveries in CERN. Right. Oh, this CERN, yeah, it's fine. Well, Madame Curie died on this day in 1934. One year later, her daughter received the Nobel Prize. So, um, from a plastic anemia contracted from her long uh, term exposure to radiation. Yeah, she was, she, by herself, she also served us as a laboratory. Not only she gave us her discovery, but not knowing better, she also became one of the first victims of, of radiation. And she was buried in a very modest graveyard in a small cemetery near, near Warsaw. But on this day um, in 1995, with full military ceremonial and thousands of students, two coffins, containing remains of Pierre Curie and Maria Curie were dug out from that ceremony and transported to Pantheon in Paris. And Pantheon is the place where the most, the biggest citizen, citizens of France are rested. She is the only woman among those. The rest are men. This ceremony was attended by presidents of Poland and France, President Wałęsa and President Mitterrand, who at this moment was fighting cancer. And in his speech, he declared the following. She was 
the symbol of a woman who inspires her, her, capa imposed her capability in a society which too often reserves intellectual functions and public responsibilities for men. And the said writer, in the name of France, I proclaim the hope that equality of rights between men and women may prevail everywhere in the world because the preference granted to men for centuries is unfair and beneath the dignity of civilized society. Who cannot agree with this? And Marie is the only woman who rests there by her own merit. There is also one other woman who is there because being a wife of another very famous professor. So this is her picture from 1934. I think one of the most beautiful pictures I've, I've seen. Photographer unknown, Smithsonian Institution. And with this picture, I would like to finish my presentation about the physicists who we all are descendants in science. Oh, and thank you for coming and for your attention. Yes. I just have a comment. It's going to take many, many more hundreds of years before the ladies get to exhibit their scientific abilities and mathematical abilities. Pretty shit up in the next time. Tough too. Tough shit. Tough too. And therefore, we always, we still, we are still not on the good foot. foot. We, are, we still welcome female students as something extra. They should be more in here. In our class, although they are coming in greater and greater numbers, and it's not only in, uh, in physics, I mean, there are some, uh, some scientists that are actually female students. I uh, enjoy it. Yeah. We have a daycare center next to our home for 39 years, and I watch the uh, First and second grade boys tease the girls and they're jealous of their mental powers. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, teach me not men. Okay, there's a male people with this machine to kind of down. But I think that, that we are making great strides in, in this area. And this woman was one of those revolutionaries who didn't talk about it. Who didn't also when when asked she was vocal about uh, about women. She had the United States as well, but her main focus was science, physics, chemistry, and biology application. You have to, to, to take God in love with people. Oh. My first daughter, Irene, was in a little part of the school. You know, I don't see it. It was in Sydney. It was then with her husband. Was, uh, her name is Irena Joliot Curie. And uh, Dr. Joliot, Professor Joliot, it was in Sydney. But, uh, and it was a continuation of this type of uh, of, of course. Of course. You, you, are, you, are, you, know, you are growing, you know, uh, in uh, this, this atmosphere of glowing, uh, uh, glowing, so cool. Yes. Um, and I'm asking this of any of the collegiate folks out there. Are you seeing more females in physics? Um, I teach it at the high school level, and. Um, I'm still getting very low numbers in my AP classes of the females. This is the age. This is the kind of age where girls tend to underrate themselves because they won't, don't want to smother their, their, their body. Do you still have that going on? I think know? so. I cannot answer your question now directly because I 
do not teach physics for physics. This would be Dave <laughs> who can answer this question. I teach in physics uh, in pre-med and for, for different disciplines. I teach physics uh, in supported role. So I, I don't have a clear picture on this part. But I follow the, the development well being a father of, of a girl. <laughs> Who became proper? David, um, yeah, our numbers, I think they're still low. They're still in the minority. Um, it fluctuated quite a bit, though. So, I mean, I've had some classes where they were uh, close to about half the class, and then some classes where uh, they're not. So, varies a lot. It is still this, you know, uh, this thought that, that physics is too difficult, it is too difficult for everybody, or just selected few, but among the selected few, uh, no, I don't think that there's enough, enough women. But that, definitely not for, for the intellectual yeah. But you know, for some reason though, sometimes you'll have a, a class where there'll be only one uh, female student, and she's a top student in the class. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? All right, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, before you go, I have a, a few announcements to make. Um, first off, uh, I just wanted to let you know about our upcoming, uh, some of our upcoming talks. And um, all this information is available on our website. Next week, we're going to have a talk uh, on space weather by uh, Patricia Rice at um, Rice University. She'll be here. And um, following that, uh, you can see the rest of them online. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Lori, uh, who uh, is a um, NASA JSC engineer, and she's going to also she's going to be teaching a course here as part of our engineering physics subplan under our um, new uh, bachelor's degree in physics. And um, then after that, we've got Paul Withy, who is our new uh, faculty member that we just hired in physics. And he's going to be talking uh, on February 21st. I'm not going to go through the rest of the list, but just to let you know, we do have a full schedule, and all this information is available on the website. Also, um, there is going to be a physics club meeting uh, probably this Friday. I'm going to put something on our Facebook site about that. So um, if anybody's interested, um, I will have more information on that. Just be um, on your toes if that's going to be coming up. And finally, um, I did hand out a, um, a sign-in sheet. And actually, there was two of them floating around. And I asked everybody to sign in. You don't have to leave your email address if you don't want to. But it's just sort of a good thing for us to keep track of how many people are attending these lectures so that... Um, you know, just so we know for future planning and, and um, also to show that we are providing some value to the community. So uh, I'd like the students who are here for um, physics uh, 40, uh, 4732 and uh, 6838 to, to stick around. But everybody else, thank you for coming out. <laughs>